thank you very much for attending. Uh, and uh, as you can see, the beginning of this talk is a bit different from, from usual. Uh, we also have quite some equipment here on the table. It looks quite as messy as my desk usually. Uh, <laughs> but since we are talking about devices, I think it makes sense to bring some uh, devices on stage. And since we are talking about containers uh, and how you can run containers on devices, why not running my presentation from a container on my device? Huh? This seems to make sense. So the first step in the presentation is going to run the container. Uh, here I have a board from Toradex, that's the company we are working for, uh, that it's running uh, our new OS that is named Horizon, is Linux-based OS. Uh, and I'm going to start a container using Docker. Uh, as you can see on this screen, we already have some cute demos. And later on in the presentation, we discover uh, how they are running. So I'm going to start the container. If it works, this already proved my point. If it doesn't, I still have 50 minutes to try to do it. So let's see if it's working. 192, 168. Six five zero two. Who knows what six five zero two is? Is the CPU for the Commodore sixty four? I mean, so everyone in the room is younger than me. I can guess. <laughs> <laughs> so the title of this session is "Put Your Application in a Container and Ship It to Many Embedded Devices." And uh, hopefully, in the next hour with Stefan, uh, we are going to be able to explain you how to do it. So, uh, first, a quick introduction about the speakers. So my name is Stefan Eichenberger, and I'm a field application engineer at Toradex. And my colleague is basically Walter Minute. He is a senior software developer at Toradex. So he is taking care about Horizon a lot and Docker stuff. Yes. Yeah. And uh, the company is based in Switzerland. Uh, as you can hear from my accent, I'm not Swiss myself. But I will try to hide my Italian accent by waving my hands a lot when I'm talking. <laughs> So a few words about Toradex. Uh, what we do, basically, we do computer modules. Uh, if you want more information about this, we have a nice booth upstairs. Uh, so those are small computers that you can use to run Linux or uh, other uh, full-feature operating systems. And of course, on top of that, you can run your Qt application. Um, Toradex was founded in 2003, and we are uh, extremely fast growing. So today we are more than 135 people worldwide uh, in eight global offices. So if you need some local um, warehouse or something, we are we should be there basically. The headquarter, however, however, is in Lucerne, Switzerland. This is where I come from. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about. Uh, oh, this is also showing uh, our history, but. I will leave this for, uh, for reference. Uh, so let's talk about containers. Uh, let's first talk about containers in the real world. Uh, I think everyone knows what a container is in the real world. It's a big metal box. Uh, they are funny color. They look all the same. And uh, they became very popular uh, around the 60s, mostly during the Vietnam War. If you want to learn something about the history of, of containers, there is a nice uh, podcast from the BBC named the 50 things that change the modern economy. And one of the episodes is about the container. And the point is, the container itself is not such a big invention. I mean, it's just a metal box. But what's really valuable about container is that this metal box has some super standardized measurements. And every feature in the container is standardized. Each and every container looks like any other container. And this is pretty cool from the point of view of transportation, because you can load, unload, and move containers around in the same way. You don't mind if it's furniture inside, documents, or any kind of product. Just ship them around, and all the containers are the same. This really changed the way stuff is delivered around the world. This changed the shape of ports in the, all the major cities, and so on. And so now let's move <laughs> to, to software. Yeah, as, as Walter said, uh, as no, metal containers basically changed how ports ports and everything was built. I think software containers basically um, change how software de development works. So you, you basically put 
all your dependencies and all your um, applications inside to the docker uh, inside the docker container or any other container and then you ship this container in a standardized way to your customer or to your target device um, it also gives you a slight isolation from from uh, the running system so a docker container normally has uh, a lightweight isolation from the the host system so that it has a different file system uh, root file system um, however it's not a super secure system you if you it's not as isolated as if you would use a virtual machine yeah yeah uh, there is this common uh, misconception uh, many times we talk about containers and uh, people tend to associate containers with virtual machines and those are completely different things. Even if, like in open embedded, the layers is still meta virtualization, <laughs> uh, they actually don't have much to do with uh, with virtualization. Uh, so, uh, you know, in every presentation, you have uh, you need to have some architecture diagram. So this is the share. <laughs> uh, this is the architecture diagram of pretty much any uh, modern operating system, but in this case, specifically for Linux. Uh, and we have multiple processes. Uh, each process is separated from the other, so we have uh, an MMU taking care of this. Uh, and they run on top of the file system, and we also use the file system to access any hardware, anything inside uh, a Unix-based system. Uh, and then we have a kernel and some hardware underneath. And the kernel is sort of managing all the interaction between the high-level software and the hardware. Uh, if we move to virtualization, uh, oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, sorry. In, in this model, uh, we have multiple virtual machines. And inside each virtual machine, we have the same uh, um, model we have seen before. Uh, but the difference is that this time, we don't have any real hardware, but we have some kind of virtualized hardware. And underneath, we have an hypervisor that does the magic of making this, uh, let's say, fake hardware uh, behave on top of some real hardware. Um, of course, this requires, first of all, some kind of hardware support. You need a CPU that has some support for virtualization. And second, you have some overhead. That's why the first time someone inside Toradex started talking with me about containers, uh, it was Brandon, that is currently our CTO. Uh, we were in Seattle. We are just having coffee at like 10 in the morning. So yeah, I'm thinking about the new stuff, and I think we should run containers. And I told him, Brandon, you're not supposed to have beer at 10 in the morning. I mean, <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, uh, container is stuff for hipsters, you know, and uh, they are going to require lots of resources. You know, it's like virtual machines. And then, no, no, look a bit better into this, because it's really not virtual machine. It's not that heavy. And if you look at the container model, Actually, uh, we still have processes, we still have a uh, file system in between, and we still have the kernel and the hardware. We don't have any virtualization in between. We are talking with the real kernel running on top of the real hardware. A process running inside the container is just a user mode process, as any other application process you can run on your Linux system. The difference is that this process is living in a sort of sandbox where his vision of the file system is different from any other process in the system. So using containers, we sort of create a different file system for the different processes we want to run in our system. But in terms of overhead for API calls and whatever, that's the same as a user mode process. We don't have any additional layer in between. So this is an important thing to clarify just to clear out the idea that we are running some fake hardware in between. It's just a regular process. We are just tricking it into seeing something more limited. So yeah, what, what are the advantages of containers? As, said, as, well as Walter showed before, it's some kind of isolation. Um, that's what we saw in before. However, it also, and that was what I said before, uh, it allows you to pack things together. So it, it allows you to, to put all your dependencies, your libraries, where you, what can be a nightmare under Linux. Um, I don't know who of you is a Yocto developer or something, or uses doc, uh, Yocto. And my experience is, 
you always have to use an older distribution because if you use a newer distribution, something will break for sure. And Docker overcomes this, this problem because you can basically spin up an older Ubuntu version and then you can just use the Docker instance for compiling your Yocto project based distribution. Yeah. Yeah, also also the, the fact that you have different visions of the file system means that basically each and every dependencies of your application is in a separate file system. And sometimes this is really critical because you may have multiple components in your system, but if you build a monolithic image, some library should match just a single version. And maybe this version is too new for some things or too old for others. And if you move forward, you maybe have to touch something you don't want to touch anymore and vice versa. If you don't move forward, maybe you know that you have security issues and so on. Exactly. And another nice thing is you can also re uh, reduce the, the resources. So you can really say um, my container image should only consume 50% of the available CPU resources. And if it tries to use more than that, then the, the, the kernel basically says, no, this container only allows to have 50% uh, of the CPU usage and we don't give him the other time. OK, of course, there are also some drawbacks. Uh, the first one is that probably we need some more resources. OK, we are a hardware manufacturer, so we are happy to sell you a model with more memory <laughs> and storage, <laughs> even if this is getting cheaper and cheaper. Um, but uh, also on this point, be careful. Don't just do the simple math by adding the size of each and every image and getting a total. It's really not working like this. Uh, containers work in layers, and many times you are able to reuse those layers. So most of the basic uh, OS itself, it's reused by multiple containers, and this helps saving a lot of space and also a lot of memory at runtime. Because uh, if you load the library in Linux without containers in between, if two applications are loading the same library, memory for the code is allocated only once. That happens also with containers. Even if they run two different file system images, if this library is down in one of the common layers, that also happens. So you don't use twice the memory. Uh, of course, as uh, uh, Stefan was mentioning before, uh, we have less isolation compared uh, to a virtual machine. But on the other side, in the worst case, we are running exactly as a user mode process. So maybe we are not making things uh, uh, much better from the point of view of security, but for sure it's not getting worse. So it's a really good compromise. And uh, our application inside containers, as I said before, they are sandboxed. So basically we decide what this application can access in the system. And as Stefan already said, we can also limit the resources. So I'm going also to the next one because you need the old grumpy embedded developer for this. <laughs> why <laughs> why should use, uh, we should use container on devices? You know, there are an exclamation mark because you, you should imagine these sentences uh, from the mouth of an old time angry <laughs> embedded developer, like myself at the end. <laughs> so that, yeah, well, we are going to waste resources. Uh, uh, and of course, why should uh, we develop using high level languages and frameworks uh, or those technologies are coming from servers, you know, it's stuff from hipsters, and we don't want to touch these things. Uh, and I mean, some of those points make sense. Also, this may add some complexity uh, in our system in terms of architecture and also the beginning about learning new, new stuff. Um, but at the end, you should also wait uh, what are the advantages of containers. And, uh, if we think about some technologies that migrate from the server environment to the embedded environment, I think we have a good answer, a good example for this. Yeah, some years ago, basically, it was the same thing with Linux. So who thought 20 years ago that uh, Linux would nowadays run on almost all embedded devices besides some really, really small devices? So. Um, Back then, the people said, yeah, no, this, this operating system is not usable for uh, embedded devices. It's basically developed for desktops, and it's heavily used for servers. Um, and it has a lot of overhead because it uses process isolation and things like that. It, uses, it has to, uh, the, the processor basically needs an MMU. So why should we, do, we use something like Linux on an embedded device? 
However, nowadays, basically everyone is using Linux. So, yeah. if you read this list, basically, I mean, systems. each of those points is a good reason to not use Linux on an embedded device. But how many people in this room are using Linux on an embedded device? I mean, so. <laughs> okay, we have an answer. <laughs> okay, so nowadays, uh, lots of, uh, of people and companies are using Linux to build uh, embedded devices, and we can get to market quickly because using the same operating system everyone else uses means uh, easy uh, access to hardware support, lots of drivers, uh, and so on. Uh, we have secure devices, and this is coming by the fact that Linux is still used on servers. Every uh, security feature that it's implemented on the server, it's available on the device. We can choose what we want to use, what is too heavy, what is, makes sense to use, but everything is available. And this is just because it's used on servers. And uh, also Linux is here to stay. I mean, it's pretty clear that it's not going to disappear, uh, even if it's Linux Torvald one day decide to, I don't know, dedicate himself to gardening or whatever. <laughs> the community, it's so big that this is not going to, to change the future of the operating system. So yeah, basically as Walter said, Linux won't disappear. It will also be the same for containers. They won't disappear anymore because they are now established. They are used in the server market. They, they will also be used on embedded devices, if you trust us. Um, <laughs> and yeah, everything that nowadays, I think that the embedded world is really going more in the direction of desktop systems and servers than vice versa. Of course, you still have the really low-end devices and they are still necessary, but there we anyway don't talk about Linux or containers at all. So it's, it's really targeting this edge devices between uh, where you have MMU available, where you have speedy processors, where you have a lot of memory. And uh, if you... If you want other samples about technologies that move and change their focus, uh, let's think about Java. I started developing in Java in 1996, and at that time it was designed for running in the browser, running cool applets to give a better UI for, for uh, websites. Uh, luckily I stopped in 1997 <laughs> because this stuff was definitely not working. It was, you know, right once run everywhere, became right once debug everywhere. And, uh, but then Java moved to the server world and now to the mobile world with, as a main language of development for Android. So technologies change their focus and maybe something that it's not working so well in one environment works amazingly well in another one or can cover multiple environments. And we have also another good example with Qt. It started uh, as a toolkit to uh, be portable between desktop application, uh, then there is a story about mobile, and now it's really uh, desktop and embedded. And it has been changing over time, of course, to adapt to all those different scenarios, but it can cover quite a lot of different uh, user scenarios with the same technology. Uh, yeah, why why should you basically use uh, run a Qt application in in your container and not <laughs> directly with boot to Qt or something like that? It's really about first of all isolation, so you or separation more. You can separate your BSP from the running instance. So one example is for Toradex, if we would provide you the the BSP support and the BSP out of the box we can take care about your BSP and you have to take care about uh, the application running in the container. You can use newer versions of boot to Qt or whatever inside your container and you don't have to care about the, the version of the BSP anymore. You can also use different runtimes. So you can, for example, use the LGPL version in one container and then you can use the the, the commercial version in another container and they will, will not touch each other and the, you, you can, can have basically both library installed on the same embedded system. The encapsulation we already talked about, so it's basically the file system encapsulation and it really uh, nicely integrates into other frameworks and runtimes, so you can have Alpine, um, Debian, installed in parallel and then you can run on one system maybe Nginx, on the other one Qt in another 
the container even Java if you need to. And that's, that's really nice. So you have a lot of options where you can run different things in parallel and the maintenance will be much, much uh, easier to do than if you would only have one system and you always have to care about the dependencies between libraries and frameworks. Yeah, and we should also think that nowadays devices are getting more and more complex. When I started working on embedded devices uh, in the previous century, <laughs> uh, I mean, having a screen was already something like crazy. I mean, we have a we have a 320 by 240 monochrome screen. I mean, we can do a lot of things. And today it's taken for granted. Uh, we want very nice UIs. We want maybe to be able to access our device using a web browser because we are not sitting in front of it. Uh, we would like to have maybe an API that applications, other applications can use to integrate with our device. And uh, I know Qt cover quite a lot of those scenarios, but maybe we have some legacy code in the company or we have some knowledge in the company we want to leverage and this not, does not involve Qt. And we can have a different container running, uh, I don't know, .NET Core or Nginx or Node.js, whatever you want to run, and still have cute application for the local UI or to manage the, the, the whole system. Uh, but in this way, if we split this between different containers, if for some reason we discover a bug or security issue in, I don't know, Node.js, and this forces us to change a version of some underlying libraries, we are not forced to do the same change into the container running the cute application that is managing our system as it's more critical. We can just update the front end and they are going to run two different versions of the same library at the same time. Of course, maybe over time we are going to migrate to the new version, also the uh, other part of the software, but we are not forced to do everything at the same time because we need to release a big monolithic image. So how can you run a Qt application inside your container? That's basically probably why you are here. Um, there are more or less two ways. So one, one way is you can use a generic Linux distribution like Debian or Fedora or Arch, Alpine Linux. And then you simply have to install your uh, Qt libraries with, for Debian APT. And for the other ones, I'm never sure, <laughs> so I don't say anything. Um, and you can even install Qt for Python there. Um, Another way, what you and we will show a demo about that as well. So first, we will basically show you a demo about the generic uh, idea, and then about the boot to Qt stuff. You can, of course, also compile a boot to Qt image with um, Yocto, and then you can import this root file system into a Docker container, and then you can run your boot to Qt, even proprietary licensed application inside the container. Um, one thing, um, Torizon, so the system we show today, is basically using the open source graphic drivers at the moment. So it's the Etnaviv graphics driver. Therefore, if you would have to compile it by yourself, the boot to Qt stuff, you have to use, use mainline BSP in the local.conic. It's, it's very well documented, but um, that's some trick because then boot to Qt, Qt will also use the the open source graphic drivers. Yeah, and in Trizon we choose to use the uh, open source driver, or better, we choose to stay as close to mainline as possible. That's the idea. Uh, using the open source version, maybe we lose a little bit of performances, but on the other side, we are supposed to be maintaining these things for 10, 15 years. And uh, if you have the source code, Worst case, you should be able to look into it and fix some bugs. If it's a closed source solution, at some point they stop supporting, you are stuck with a defined kernel version and moving forward is going to be quite hard. So talking about the graphics, that it's probably the, I mean, we know that we are using container in a different scenario from what is the mainstream usage of containers. And one of the interesting points is how to run a UI from a container. Because of course, if I want to make a device that has a web-based UI or something like this, it's more or less a small server. But if I have a full-blown UI in front of the user, then uh, it's definitely no, lo no longer uh, <laughs> a server anymore. Or it can be also a server, but also more likely uh, a desktop machine or something like that. Um, basically, we use Wayland 
uh, as uh, our uh, protocol to support the graphic UI. And uh, interestingly, uh, all the Wayland related components are also running inside containers. So basically, uh, we have a Wayland server. Actually, the right term is compositor. We use Weston. And this compositor, it's running in a container that has access uh, to the GPU, to the DRM interface of the kernel. So this container, it's running with more privileges than, uh, a, let's say, normal container with the user mode application. But, I mean, even if you run an X server, this is accessing hardware, so it's running with, I guess, privileges. So still, OK, it's not fully isolated, but it's not worse than what we have been doing before. Um, and if we run Wayland, basically, we have three choices uh, from the application point of view. Uh, we may have an application that just uses the Wayland socket. So basically, all the communication happens over the socket, and what you need to do is to share the socket uh, in the, from the server to the different clients. Uh, in Docker, you can do this by bind mounting some folders. So you bind mount the folder where the socket is and do the same thing in the client. If you do something like this, basically Wayland works by uh, letting application allocate surfaces. So you allocate a surface on the screen, you get the memory area, you can do pretty much whatever you want with this memory, painting your uh, contents. If you use Qt, of course, everything is nicely wrapped, so you don't touch Wayland any, uh, in any way, uh, and this works. Uh, if you want to do some accelerator rendering, so if you want to use OpenGL or other technology that needs to uh, basically uh, bleed some content into a memory area, uh, then also your application container may need some privileges. So you can decide to let it access some hardware, some at the end uh, entries under slash dev, uh, or to mount some devices into it, and uh, maybe you need to increase the privileges. Uh, one easy way to do it is to run it with minus minus privileged. So it basically runs at the highest level of, of, of privileges, but uh, Docker and also other uh, container runtime environments give you more granular control over those privileges so you can choose exactly what this container is supposed to be doing and what it can do. So you can still have some sandboxing, some isolation. You need to access hardware because you need a GPU to run and to render stuff in your memory, so this should be allowed. But again, this is the standard model we have been using uh, all the time. And if you have some legacy applications, so uh, applications still using X11, uh, then uh, Wayland, or better Weston, provide uh, a compatibility layer that is named X Wayland. So basically, with X Wayland, your X application thinks that it's running on top of X and it's still running. Okay. So you have three different solutions. Of course, in terms, in terms of performances, the best solution uh, is to use Wayland and OpenGL to accelerate the rendering. Uh, if you don't need uh, super fast rendering, like if you are using uh, an application with widgets or something like this, maybe uh, just the Wayland socket is okay. If you don't want to touch your legacy code, you can have X11 compatibility. And of course, you can have those three kinds of applications running side by side in different containers. OK, so we quickly, first of all, uh, talk about our presence at the event. Uh, we are going to have, of course, this talk. <laughs> uh, the, at uh, 12, uh, we are going to change the topic and switching to Python. So we are going to show how to use Qt for Python, again, on embedded devices. Uh, and uh, later on at uh, Alpha 3, uh, I think the room is wrong, sorry, in this slide. Uh, it's in a different room. But Stefan is going to have a talk about Q3D. And of course, we have our boot upstairs. So if you want to uh, get more information or to see more demos or to talk about those topics, you are very welcome to, uh, to come there and, uh, and continue the discussion. OK, so uh, now we have a couple of demos. Uh, you know, the first one was already running the presentation and it worked, so <laughs> that's already one. Well, please count one successful demo at the end. <laughs> um, the second one is uh, showing how to run Qt application in containers. So uh, I still have the webcam, yes. Okay. So here uh, you can see, uh, sorry, the image is really not uh, <laughs> super clear, but uh, those are very familiar Qt demos. Uh, I think everyone has tried to run and look into this, uh, the code of the, those applications, and they are running on the same screen uh, on top of Wayland. 
But the interesting part is that they're running in containers. How can I show you this? Uh, I need to sit down because I need to look at my screen. Uh, we have uh, another tool that is named Portainer. And uh, I mean, I'm getting a bit repetitive on this, but also Portainer is running inside the container. <laughs> and uh, Portainer is actually a tool designed to manage uh, containers uh, on a system uh, using a web-based UI. So uh, Portainer, it's also running on the device. You see here, I am connected to the device IP address. And uh, I'm seeing what's happening on the target. And here. You can see that we have 14 containers. Some of them are running, some of them don't, because are just some attempts I made before to, to do some kind of <laughs> experiments. You also see that Docker is assigning some funny names to containers. And, but if you look into this, this is the presentation. Those are the four cute applications you see on the screen. And this is the Wayland server. The name is super long because it's some stuff we still haven't published on our, <laughs> our official uh, repos, but we are going to do that soon. So this is the server, and then we have multiple clients talking with it, and they are sharing the screen. Of course, you can also share, uh, commu communicate between the different containers. Uh, in Docker, for example, you can create virtual network between different containers, so you can have a server that it's only talking with local application. So you don't need to open the server uh, outside of your device. It's still running there, and you can select which client can talk to this server. So you can build quite complex and secure uh, architecture with this technology. OK, then I switch to uh, Stefan. Ah, oh, sorry, uh, I just wanted to show quickly uh, how do we run the containers uh, and a couple of other things. Uh, so one thing, you see the storage uses, say, 11 gigabytes. That's not true, because actually the, modules, uh, the module has less than this storage. <laughs> uh, but what happens here uh, is that most of, for example, the Qt demos uh, are using uh, exactly the same base image, the same Debian version. I added Qt on top. Uh, I added the demos. And the only difference is the application that they are starting. So basically, the size used by those containers is not the size of one of those multiplied by four, but it's just the size of the first one. And that's true also partly for the server, because we use the same version of Debian Buster. So up to that point, everything is shared. So the total amount is really, it's really less that, uh, than what you see. And I would just want to quickly show how, to, how I run them. Uh, I have multiple devices here, OK. This is a file made with Docker Compose. Docker Compose basically is a simple tool that allows you to start multiple containers in a defined sequence. And we need to do that because, of course, since we have Wayland, uh, the Wayland compositor that acts as a server, we need first to start the Wayland compositor, and then we start all the client application. But you can see that for most of the application, I'm just bind mounting the slash temp folder. That is where the Wayland socket is created. OK, we can switch the. OK. Yeah, now we have to switch. Well, I need piece. to find the HDMI plug. OK, and also the camera. So, uh, Sorry, we have some. When you do demos with devices, you still have to deal with, the, with some cabling. <laughs> OK. Is that this? Oh. So what, what you basically, so this, this demo here now runs not on the, um, with Wayland or something like that. It really uses EGLFS. Um, and it's the commercial version of boot to Qt. However, it would also work with the open source version. It was just more comfortable with the, the, the commercial thing. And it's super ugly. That's how I do, do user interfaces. I'm not a designer, so yeah, <laughs> sorry for that. And it's just a demo to, to turn on and off a LED. You could see the LED here, basically. That's the LED. Can you do that? <laughs> so that one is the LED. And if I turn it off, 
Yeah, it's it's basically the embedded version of Hello World, you know. You yeah. need to turn so on the su dolphin. Super ID. boring. But <laughs> and what I would like to show you is um, that you basically can also debug as you are used to with with boot to Qt or Qt for embedded devices, whatever. Um, so you can set breakpoints. And if I should, if I click now on enable. Should stop at in the breakpoint, and you can continue as it would be a normal um, contain a, a normal Qt application. So there is no different uh, difference about using uh, boot to Qt in a container or directly on on your file system. Uh, what you need to do is when you define your container, you need to open. Uh, for example, the network ports you want to use. So if you need a network port, you need the network port for the debugging connection. Uh, of course, you have to explicitly open it. And when you run the container, you also need to specify that you want to map it to a local port on your system. So basically, everything that is not explicitly exposed should be uh, denied. OK, so this also adds a little bit of security on top of the system. Exactly. So yeah, here it's basically the port for the QML debugger that you have to open, and as well for the GDB server. So these are and SSH as well. Um, one other nice thing is that I would like to show you now here um, because we mix some technologies. So there is this new stuff WebAssembly, and I wanted to try it out. Um, I basically split up this this super simple application into a backend and a frontend. And the front end always communicates through um, Q, uh, web sockets, basically with the back end. And what you can do that now, now with that is basically you can write your um, or you can compile your front end with WebAssembly, and then you can run the same application in a browser, and you have a really easy uh, remote control of the application. You should show the camera so yeah. we can see that. On the camera, can you have it on? A, oh. oh, now it, now it will be. Now it will get tricky. So <laughs> yeah, so I will move to this so side, otherwise I'm covering the screen myself. Okay, this works. And you still can in, turn on and off the the LED basically from your PC. The nice thing now about this solution, because we are using container, we are not. We we don't have to use the boot to Qt container to also host the web server. So here I used um, Alpine Linux, which is a really small distribution. Um, and I installed the web server there. It's not set up correctly or anything like that, but just to show, um, we really have two si systems. We have two root file systems. One is using boot to Qt to, to, to run the, the boot to Qt application. And the other one is basically hosting a web server and is using Alpine Linux, which is a completely different application, uh, a different um, operating system. Yeah, so this is the last demo. The point of this presentation is we are not here to tell you that containers are going to solve each and every issue, you know, from turning on and off an LED to peace in the Middle East. It's not going to happen. No technology can do <laughs> everything. Uh, the point is uh, this stuff is here. It works, I hope that you can, you can see it working in our demos. Uh, it's another tool you have. In some scenario, probably building your image uh, using boot to qt or building your image using Yocto or Open Embedded uh, is still the best solution. I'm not going to complain. <laughs> uh, but this is another tool. So now you know that it exists. And maybe in your mind, you already see some scenarios where this probably makes sense. OK. So yeah, we are really not pushing this as the only solution. Even Horizon itself can run without the container runtime. Exactly. Well, maybe one other thing, but it's really nice for, for this container here that I have with the, the boot to queue stuff. So if you think about maintenance, you can really take the same container and run it on a on an IMX7, for example, without with almost no change. You simply have to use the the, the frame buffer plugin instead of the EGLFS plugin. And you don't have to change anything on your application. You can re rerun. So now it's really as with Java, write <laughs> once and run everywhere, basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And also, uh, the, the, um, the point is uh, you can also 
let's say, work on an embedded device um, in a way that it's more closer to what you probably do when you develop a PC application. You run on top of a distribution, you install your libraries, and you put your application inside it. You don't have to care about the old system. We provide our system, we provide binaries. Horizon is full open source, so if you want, you can still build it, uh, and maybe you need to do that to do some uh, deep level customization. But as it is, it's already ready to run some uh, quite some kind of applications. OK, this is uh, the end of our contents. We have plenty of time for questions. So if you don't ask any question, I'm going to talk about some super boring stuff. So please. <laughs> <laughs> no, please ask some questions. <laughs> Uh, sorry, before they ask questions, I have questions for the audience. How many people already use containers? OK, OK, I was expecting less. How many people are happy about using them? OK. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you use containers on an embedded device? Two, three, four, OK, OK. That's very good. <laughs> Hello, uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, the, this application here, is the source code available somewhere? Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's on, on the GitHub Eichenberger. I put it on my local uh, repo, but it's you can also search for Toradex, and then I should be somewhere in the company organization, and you can click on it. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and then um, how do you, I mean, Docker is really cool for, uh, actually shipping the whole uh, application, how do you handle updates or in general deployment of the uh, application? Do you already have a system in place here? Uh, in Horizon, we have, uh, we have support for over-the-air updates for the OS itself. So any uh, change, any security patch we do to the OS can be deployed using an OTA system. Uh, we are still uh, working on the container integration. What you can do right now is just do Docker pool. If you do Docker pool, basically it's checking on the Docker registry, or you can use, even use a custom registry. Uh, it's checking if there is a more recent version of, of your image. It's going to download it and run it. And this is also usually quite efficient, because if, if you haven't changed the base image, so the base distribution you are using, but just added components or maybe replaced your application with a newer version, uh, uh, the system is only downloading the layer that you modified. So it's, it's also quite fast. But yeah, we are, we are thinking about a more integrated solution. But at the moment, we, uh, we don't have any answer. Or uh, we are open also for feedback about this. Anyone else? Did you try uh, run a uh, Docker on bare metal? No, we didn't. Because uh, I saw this possibility, but uh, I didn't yeah, yeah, try that, it myself. But I, that is, uh, to. I tried this on a, on a, on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, it's an interesting solution, but, but honestly, then maintaining the underlying system can be hard. You can save some resources, but honestly, I, I think you are... Uh, adding a lot more more complexity to the system. It's interesting. Maybe you know. Maybe in the future, this stuff is going to be a bit more integrated with the OS itself. That that may happen. But yeah. Thank you. Uh, just one question. What about the? Support for containers on a dedicated core. For example, if you have a multi-core. Uh, for let's say quad-core processor, can you just isolate the container to run on a single pro on a single processor, like some mm -hmm. equivalent to C groups or something like that, uh, to dedicate resources to achieve some like some soft real-time constraints? Uh, actually, Docker itself it's using C groups to implement the the magic. Um, I'm not sure that you can limit the cores where a container can run. Uh, honestly, I should check that. Uh, what you can limit for sure is the amount of CPU your container is allowed to use. Uh, so basically, and also the level of priority of the processes inside that container. Um, so the idea there is sort of the system protects itself from the containers. You, you, may, you may want to avoid the situation where some containers are using 100% uh, of the CPUs, or maybe they are allocating all the memory and so on. Uh, about limiting CPUs, I remember some options, but I'm not sure that it's really it's really doing what you ask. But we can check if you can probably do it. So 
So also using containers? Oh, okay, so thank you. <laughs> but if you want to come to our booth and discuss, I'm really happy to learn about this. <laughs> okay, so oh, we still have some time. Or? Yeah, we still have plenty of time if you okay, have so. questions. Okay, how many people are going to try using Docker on an embedded device after this session? <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Let me know about <laughs> the results. Okay. And anyway, if you want to keep up the discussion or talk about uh, our hardware and products or just getting some cool stickers from Toradex or Horizon, <laughs> just come upstairs to our booth. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And, uh, now we are going to have a session about uh, Python uh, yeah. starting in 10, 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, little less 15 than minutes. 10 minutes. Yeah. So. Oh. Do come back. <laughs>